A 2.7 trillion shilling budget coming right in the middle of a global economy crisis. Quite a unique time for a country also just emerging from a locust invasion and floods. An already depressed economy with choking public loans now likely to get worse. Tonight on the front row, we look at this all-important policy document, the budget. What does it mean for you in the wake of the ongoing COVID-19? Do we have the necessary shock absorbers to weather this storm? Are we making the right decisions with our money? Take a seat on front row tonight as we hear from a panel of experts. I am Akisa Wandera. Glad you could join us tonight on the front row. Now, to be part of this edition of the Front Row, send in your questions by logging into slido.com. Enter event code as hashtag the Front Row. We'd love to hear from you. We're also available on Twitter at KTN News KE at Akisa Wandera. Use the hashtag the Front Row. And here now is or are our panelists for this conversation. We'll start with Dr. David Ndi. He's the managing director of Africa Economics. Ndi is, the, is also an economist. Uh, who served as a technical advisor on public finance to the Committee of Experts. He's an avid reader and also a columnist joining us tonight. Just give us his thoughts on the budget and the economic situation Kenya finds itself in. Second, we have Rose Moura, who is a certified public accountant of Kenya and the national chairperson of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya, ISPAC. She's experienced in financial management audit, risk management, and corporate governance. She runs Rockville Consulting Limited, a business advisory firm, as a CEO. She also serves as an independent non-executive director for a local insurance company and chairs the legal and regulatory committee of the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you, Rose, for joining us tonight. And finally... We have Mr. Bill Okero, a former senator for Mandera County, and was also the former chairperson of the Senate Finance, Commerce and Budget Committee, a member of the Devolved Government Sessional Committee, a member of the Liaison Committee, and is also a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya and Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya. He's also a certified corporate governance trainer and, an ex and has extensive audit and accounting experience in both public and private sectors. And I should also mention he was a shadow finance minister in uh, the ninth parliament and, of course, the Kanu party. Thank you for joining us tonight. So let's now break the budget speech down for you even further and look at the aspects that will affect you directly. Malika Kazia with that report before we get into the conversation. All right, I understand we do not have that story ready, but we'll be getting it shortly. It was meant to be a precursor to just set the tone for this particular conversation. But let's get down into it. Since um, the Cabinet Secretary Treasury read out the budget on Thursday last week, there's been a lot of say and talk about this 2.7 trillion budget and what it means coming right amidst a pandemic. Tonight, we look at the bigger picture. What does this mean for us? What does it mean for you and I? Does it mean more money in our pockets? Does it mean we need to save as much as we can to survive? Let's speak to our experts. And I think we'll start with Rose Maura because ISPAC has continually advised the government since this pandemic started on what to do to ensure we have enough money to channel it towards the COVID-19 um, response, on what to do to ensure we cushion Kenyans, looking at the document that the Cabinet Secretary for Treasury came out with on Thursday. What does it look like for you? What does it mean for you from your point of view? Thank you very much, uh, Akisa. Good evening, viewers. And thank you for having me on the panel today evening. Um, the budget that was released um, by the uh, by the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Treasury on uh, th uh, Thursday last week about a 2.79 um, trillion uh, budget um, and of course um, 
out of that uh, huge chunk of um, the funds are going to go into uh, debt service and another huge uh, chunk of those funds are, is going to go into recurrent, um, you know, uh, paying for recurrent expenditure, um, such as, uh, you know, s uh, salaries um, and, and so forth, pension, um, constitutional committees, and part of it is going to go um, to the counties. Uh, and of course, um, if you're going to spend money, even in your own household, you must have a way to, you know, to raise that fund. And um, we're seeing that, um, there's about, uh, looking at uh, sources of revenue, about 1.9 um, trillion. So right off the bat, we're talking about um, a deficit of about 840 billion. And um, what this means is that, um, uh, of course, uh, we may have to dig um, deeper into our pockets. But of course, uh, with, the, with the issue of um, COVID, we're really looking at uh, trying to cushion, uh, you know, the Mwananchi, trying to stimulate um, the economy. So we're finding that um, even, at the, you know, the cabinet secretary is um, almost stuck between uh, in a rock and a hard place because um, in April, we gave certain concessions in terms of uh, taxes, reduced uh, VAT to 14 percent, um, exempted persons earning um, under 24,000, um, shillings, among other things, but um, now when we look at that, um, which um, has been estimated is going to cost about 172 billion shillings to the government, the government has to try and find other ways to claw back um, that, that revenue. So we're going to find that um, certain um, items will increase. For example, already there's a proposal for, to increase the LPG which is the gas that we use um, on, a, on, you know, on an everyday basis. We're finding that um, there's proposed um, taxes, a 1% of turnover taxes that may hit um, uh, the SMEs quite hard. So I think overall, um, I, I, you can't really say that this is going to, uh, to necessarily cushion Monainchi. Um, there will still going to be some pain felt. Um, otherwise, um, what we would have wanted to see at the, at the Institute would really have been um, to, to, to have a budget that actually looks at uh, reducing our expenditure so that we can live within our means. Um, so for these 840 uh, billion of deficit, maybe we would have said, can we reduce this to about 400 right. billion mm -hmm. by really cutting down on our expenditure? Mm -hmm. And that would have been um, what would have been much, much better for us as a country, right. given where we are today. Right. Perhaps an austerity budget. Rose Maura there. It's a bit like her. I don't know whether you agree with her that perhaps it's time we started thinking about living within our means. Yes, but uh, first, um, my greetings to my chair, Rose, um, and my friend, Ndi. I hope both of you are keeping well. Now, the, I, I think it doesn't look like a corona budget. Um, I would have thought, uh, most of us would have thought that a corona budget would be as uh, Rosa said, would be, uh, you know, uh, there will be more austerity and the budget the expenditures will be lower. But what we have seen is, uh, as usual, a very ambitious budget. A very, as usual, what, what they do is work on the expenditure side, um, then less the revenues and the rest they put it on, 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 on debt. And I think that really uh, is not... And then when you look at it, the second aspect of it is that <clears throat> you don't see uh, a lot in terms of uh, benefiting the uh, ordinary Kenyans in, 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 in a scale that you would expect would address the impact of COVID because the impact of COVID, uh, COVID is really uh, immense and it's, it's, it's underestimated by the government. The government that keeps talking about 200,000, 300,000 people without jobs and this kind of thing. I think we're talking of millions of people losing their livelihoods, uh, have lost, you know, and thousands uh, of companies, you know, especially small uh, and medium-sized enterprises shutting down completely. And even bigger, uh, you know, aspects of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the economy, like, you know, sectors, major sectors also suffering. So uh, I, I think um, it, it's really not what some of us expected. We, uh, and, and the focus, as usual, is nothing much has changed. Usual government expenditures, um, very small amount of development, um, and, and the rest for servicing loans and so forth. 
Um, and even in these very hard times, you know, new tax measures are desperate attempts by government to try and raise tax whichever way they can, uh, which actually was not necessary. The government needed to have to reduce this expenditure. It's, it's not about budgeting, it's not about the government collecting taxes and spending. It, it can leave the money for the people to decide what to do with their money. And I think this is where this government always misses the point that tax should not be a burden of society. And it's something that I keep emphasizing at every uh, opportunity. And, and so being desperate to try and raise taxes on agricultural imports and on household things and on, you know, making condition very difficult even to claim input tax for businesses, uh, road stores and every measure that you can think of raising tax. Uh, I, I think it wasn't really necessary. It doesn't, it doesn't really uh, show a lot of um, empathy towards the suffering uh, of both the businesses mm -hmm. uh, and the ordinary people to the extent that was expected. Yeah. Well, overall comments there. Rose Mora saying um, we should have thought about living within our means. Mr. Bill Okero there talking about uh, this should have been a COVID-19 budget. Mr. Ndi, do you hold the same view? Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gisa, for having me. Let me say hello to my good friend, uh, uh, Senator Bill Okero. Good evening. And of course, the Lady Rose from East Park and, and the viewers. I, I do share some of those sentiments, actually. Um, but I think you... you when you're budgeting, doing a government budget at this point in time, you are, you are facing three things. You need to do three things. One is, of course, a public health crisis of unprecedented proportions. Although it is not here yet, uh, the scale we have seen around the world and the, what we are seeing here is you obviously need to uh, prepare uh, uh, scaling up the public health response uh, in terms of the budget. That's the first thing, uh, because the, the first obligation is to protect lives. Uh, the second thing is that it's uh, public health, the, the, the COVID-19, the novel coronavirus, has also unprecedented uh, socioeconomic impact. Um, it's created a huge economic shock uh, of a kind that we haven't actually seen before. Uh, your usual economic shocks, uh, recessions, uh, tend to be their demand side. That means that uh, people, for various reasons, don't want to spend or are not able to spend money, but businesses are actually still running and they are willing to, to, to provide, to, to, to produce goods and services, but there's no demand. So we call them demand shocks. And therefore, what you want to do is stimulate demand. That's what we call an economic stimulus. Uh, COVID-19 is a demand and supply shock. It is also affecting production, yeah, because of the uh, public health dimensions of social distancing and all the precautions we need to make. Those precautions are uh, affecting production. I think a good example is to actually use an industry, uh, which is like uh, commercial aviation. Global aviation and tourism to go with it uh, has ground to a halt. It's, it's been ground to a halt. So you cannot stimulate tourism because uh, it is both a demand and supply shock. It's very different from the usual uh, shocks we have. The third thing is that uh, that shock then becomes a fiscal shock. A fiscal shock means that government is also going to suffer in terms of revenue and therefore government also has to uh, find ways of balancing its books. Now, so we are dealing, so we need to spend more money on public health response. Uh, it needs to uh, mitigate the crisis and the way the economic crisis. And this is not a crisis you're going to, to mitigate with the traditional economic stimulus, either fiscal or monetary. Uh, it needs a different kind of mitigation. And you're not going to stimulate the economy because you cannot stimulate an economy if production has been disrupted by, uh, by COVID-19. So it's really more of providing a safety net to keep the economy going as opposed to uh, saying it back. Then you've got a revenue shock and you're talking about a government that was already in fiscal distress and what I like to call 
a, a fiscal street jacket uh, because of uh, the debt. It has a huge sort of build up a huge debt. Uh, which is now taking up a huge amount of money, uh, particularly sort of uh, on its uh, recurrent budget. So it had already very little room to maneuver. And it had little room to maneuver at a time when it was running a very huge fiscal deficit. Uh, it was running a budget deficit of about 7 to 8% of GDP, which is, it's been doing for the last six or seven years. And that's how you end up with the kind of debt it has. So you have been caught by the biggest shock of the century without the, what we call the fiscal space or headroom to be able to respond by uh, uh, pushing up the deficit. Typically, if you, if you have a low deficit, like what happened in 2007-8 during the financial crisis, if you're operating with a low deficit or even a budget surplus, say up to about 2 or 3 percent of GDP, then when you are hit by a shock like this, you can ramp that up to something like 5 or even 6 uh, percent of GDP for a short period. But if you're already running a budget deficit of 7 or 8 percent, you actually do not have the fiscal space to ramp that up to 12, 13 percent. If you start ramping that up further, you're going to create a very vicious financial crisis and it's going to blow back on you. So what you're seeing is a government which was caught at the worst possible time in terms of its fiscal uh, situation. It is also a government of, uh, which is coming to the end of its term. And you've got a president who seems to very much want to have a kind of economic legacy and uh, that he had bet yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, so, 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 so. Yes, just finish so your point. So basically, you've got various factors. You've got various factors. I'm trying to explain. You've got that. That is the environment that that you are in. So you've got various factors that require you to do what uh, Bill O'Carro called an extraordinary budget. Uh, a COVID-19 extraordinary budget. And I'm saying this government was caught in a situation where it is very difficult to do that. So what it has done, it has done a business as usual budget, which is more or less going through the motions and ignoring COVID-19 and saying, let the chips fall what they, where they may. I, I usually call it kicking the can. This is a government, it was already kicking the can before COVID-19 uh, and now more so. Uh, so I'd like to pick up from something you've mentioned about um, the economic stimulus, uh, because, I mean, from what the president said from his speech, even before we got the eight-point uh, uh, budget, we're talking about about $56 billion, um, as an economic uh, stimulus package. Does it then mean that it won't mean much for the ordinary Kenyan? Mr. Ndi. Uh, okay, me again. Let me explain what we mean by a stimulus. Uh, it, or rather, clarify. A stimulus is, is of two types. You have a fiscal or monetary. A fiscal stimulus means that you are going to run a deficit of 3% of GDP. And then you have a shock. Then you increase that to 5%. So you borrow and spend or 6% depending on the magnitude of the crisis, so as to stimulate the economy. You, by the money, you can, there are various ways of, of financing it externally, uh, borrowing from banks, borrowing from the central bank, there are various ways. But the point is, you are going to spend, let's say, 2 billion shillings that you, you're going to budget normally, but then you realize you have a crisis, a shock, and you say, no, 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 we are going to ramp that up to 2.4 billion. Uh, so a stimulus is additional. It is extra uh, spending to respond to a shock. Now, the monetary stimulus is where you go the other route. You say, we're not going to use the budget. We probably don't have the fiscal space. So government, central bank is going to buy bonds uh, and release liquidity into the economy and also which brings down interest rates. So you try and stimulate business uh, using, uh, that goes directly to, hoping that business will borrow and consumers will borrow and you stimulate the economy. Now, when you say you are already running a deficit of 7.5% of GDP last year, and you are still going to run a 7.5% of GDP, 
And then you earmark uh, quite a number of items in, uh, in, the, in the budget, uh, which are going to spend by the government in the traditional way. That is not a stimulus. You're just earmarking things in the budget using the traditional uh, mechanism, uh, sort of budget, budget process, mm -hmm. and, uh, and earmarking them. And, and all they've done is relabel. Now, let, let me point out something else. If, for COVID-19, the thing that we've been struggling with, and I've tried to articulate this before, is a policy instrument that responds to the economic distress that people are experiencing. Now, the normal government budget is not designed to, to deal with businesses which are closing, people losing jobs. It is designed for government to provide services or to spend on development projects like roads. For you to respond to COVID-19, you need a different policy instrument. Now, what I find interesting is that some time back, the government set up something they call a COVID-19 response fund. And they set up a board and all sorts of uh, uh, sort of, I think it's a board or governance mechanism. The purpose of this special purpose vehicle was to do the things that you would not ordinarily do able to do under the regular government procurement system. But now I was struck, I was hoping, I was expecting that having set up that vehicle, that during this budget, they would appropriate money into that vehicle. So if you want to do a COVID-19 response by expenditure switching, other than increasing deficit, what I would have expected is the government to say 50 billion shillings, which was going to go into roads and things and all manner of things, has now been appropriated for the COVID-19 response fund, and it is going to be managed through that structure, and it is going to respond, it is going to Maybe private sector businesses can apply, or it is going to go into social safety nets in the community. Mm -hmm. But uh, to say you are responding to COVID-19, you actually needed a policy instrument that, that is different from the regular budget. Right. But what we have done is earmark certain things in the budget and call mm -hmm. them COVID-19 response. In fact, um, when this uh, pandemic started, I think in March or April, we saw ESPAC advise both the national and county governments to revise um, their especially development expenditures downwards. So we'll have uh, Rose Maura speak extensively on that. But first, that story had earlier promised, breaking down the speech budget even further to look at the aspects that will affect you directly. Malika Kazia uh, prepared this report for us on Budget Day. Let's take a look at it. A very important briefcase characterizes National Budget Day for Kenyans. The Cabinet Secretary for Treasury, Ukuri Atani, carried the famed item to Parliament today and delivered the National Budget Reading for the financial year 2020-2021. His maiden trip in this position, one marred by the cloud of COVID-19. Our focus will be, first, to roll out an economic stimulus program that will catalyze economic activity, provide livelihoods to Kenyans, and enable businesses to recover from the adverse effects of COVID-19 pandemic. Focus on the Big Four agenda remains steady as 128.3 billion shillings has been set aside for these areas. Health comes out as a strong winner in these times and rightly so. 111.7 billion shillings has been allocated to the sector with majority close to 50 billion shillings geared towards universal health care programs. The manufacturing sector is set to receive 18.3 billion shillings. Food security has been dealt 52.8 billion shillings and affordable housing 15.5 billion shillings. The age-old criticism from various factions on the country's borrowing stands firm. The current budget deficit stands at 840.6 billion shillings. That is 7.5% of GDP. This means incurring even more debt to fill the gap, while already recurrent budget expenditure is close to a third of the budget for this financial year. Our debt remains sustainable, despite some of the debt burden indicators deteriorating due to the impact of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. The government is committed to implement the 2020 medium term debt strategy, which recommends a shift towards concessional external borrowing and lengthening of maturity structure of the domestic debt. 
The government aims to generate 38.9 billion shillings from new tax measures contained in the Finance Bill 2020. In order to ensure all taxpayers contribute to the construction and maintenance of our infrastructure, I have proposed to introduce a minimum tax that will be payable by all companies at the rate of 1% of their gross turnover. I propose to introduce digital service tax on the value of transactions at the rate of 1.5%. All in all, the contents of the briefcase held an almost underwhelming experience for Kenyans, many of whom expected bolder measures to cushion them in this time. Malika Kazia, KTN News. Malika Kazia there with that report uh, was to come to you, Rose Maura, an initial advisory to the government, and both the national and county governments, to revise some of their expenditures downwards just when we were starting to deal with this pandemic. We haven't quite seen that um, happen much. So what would be the effect of this? Um, Akisa, uh, part of that, the reason why we had uh, requested this was, uh, you know, taking a look at our overall expenditure and, and saying um, when, when you look at the country as a whole, as has been said by uh, my earlier panelists, what were the, uh, you know, two or three critical issues we needed to deal with? One, of course, was uh, the issue of uh, health care, making sure that we're able to support um, our citizens and prevent the loss of life. Uh, and then, of course, again, it's just to, to you know, to jumpstart the economy. And um, I think the second issue is actually uh, food security. Um, and then um, the third thing was to jumpstart the economy. We're also keeping in mind the fact that we know that there's about 16.4 million Kenyans who are daily wage earners. And, and therefore, uh, for any... Um, as any organizations are closing down, we felt that that money, uh, at this point in time, it was more important to move the money from, um, um, you know, some of the, the infrastructure uh, projects, the development projects, and just focus more on bringing that uh, back to try and, uh, you know, uh, jumpstart the economy, use that money um, to support um, Kenyans, uh, and also use that money to support businesses from, from a cash flow perspective. So, um, so we had suggested that, and in addition to that, we had also suggested um, just, uh, you know, support to businesses, um, because uh, I think as been, has been explained here, you really are having a situation where um, when it comes to, from a manufacturing point of view, um, those uh, organizations are not manufacturing, so from a production point of view, and also now from a demand side because there's no money, so people are getting laid off on a day-to-day a, a -day -day basis. So we thought that, you know, by, by relooking at our total um, expenditure as a country, just focusing on what is totally essential to keep us going for the next um, 12 to 24 months, um, we would then, that would be the best way for us to, to jumpstart the economy uh, and, and focus on, uh, you know, on, on starting to, to, to restart the economy and to move back um, to where uh, we could have been. So when I look at the current budget, I think there was 56 billion that has been allocated to what is um, uh, being called the um, stimulus. And if you look at 56 um, a billion in, an, in a 10 trillion economy, then you just see that, first of all, it's, it's really um, a drop in the ocean. Um, another key thing that would have been very, very important is um, the credit guarantee scheme. I know that um, there's a proposal for that, but only 3 billion shillings has been allocated to, the, to that credit guarantee scheme. Uh, and you find because of our uh, large proposed uh, deficit, um, the government is looking at borrowing almost 500 billion shillings from the domestic market, again meaning that um, banks uh, would rather lend to the government and banks will be very reluctant to lend to um, you know, SMEs and that is the money really that should have been um, used to try and get um, SMEs um, moving again. So we would want to see um, a lot more focus on businesses um, because again, um, Factors of production are really held by businesses and not necessarily um, the government. And it's only private sector, um, you know, through uh, getting businesses starting again. And then they can then employ people. And once they employ people, then there will be demand. 
for products, when there's demand for products, there, you know, uh, people can sell more and the government can then again, you know, at least collect more taxes. So it's really all very, very cyclical. And um, we, we really um, hope that the government can focus on this it's, uh, because this is really what we must focus on at, at this particular point in time. Psst. Talking about the debt conversation and uh, why we keep raising it, um, Musalia Mudavad is constantly talking about um, renegotiating our loan terms with especially national bodies like China. Bilokaro, uh, the reason why, one of the reasons why our debt has continued to go up, we've continued to raise the debt ceiling by the help of Parliament, talking about both the Senate and the National Assembly. You have been at the Senate, um, you've participated in this legislative process. Why has it been so hard for Parliament to help in cushioning Kenyans from this ballooning um, debts? Just explain for our viewers why this seems to be an uphill task for this arm of government. I think Parliament has um, um, more or less, uh, to be frank, I mean, um, uh, let's talk about National Assembly because that's where the budget gets um, uh, approved. And in the last um, uh, two parliaments, the uh, last parliament and the current one, what National Assembly is doing is more or less to rubber stamp what Treasury wants. Uh, although the Constitution is very clear with regards to taxation, with regards to debt borrowing, that the power lies with the House. However, in reality, what is happening um, is that um, Parliament has really lost uh, power in, 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 in recent times. And, 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 and you've seen today what's happening, you know, the, uh, what's playing out in the political parties, that if you don't do what the executive wants, you know, you get dewit, you get um, expelled, and so forth. So that, it, instead of Parliament, oversighting the executive. In reality, what's happening in, in recent times is the other way around. Uh, you know, the oversight, uh, the, the executive uh, oversighting parliament itself. And, and, and so, um, a good example is the debt. Last year, this minister, late last year, came and said, I will raise the level to nine trillion. And parliament approved it. Um, and he said, it's not that it's going to be you know, we're going to reach nine trillion anytime soon, but we just want to have the limit extended. But you can see, by the end of this financial year, it will be well over seven, because we're already at 6.3 trillion. Um, and, and so, what is happening in reality is that government borrows and comes to parliament to ratify, you know, um, uh, the decision that, that, that it has made. Um, and, and, and so, unfortunately, uh, parliament is not exercising the powers that we ought to exercise, uh, you know, when we're in Parliament ought to exercise, because they have it in law, they have it in the Constitution. Nothing, you know, other than the fact that uh, the leaders in, in, in politics or in, in political parties or in Parliament want to be caused with the executive, no other reason can actually be advanced why Parliament should allow this government to continue sinking this country uh, into a debt, uh, you know, and, 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 and you've seen from the time of Eurobond, uh, you know, we, we used part of that money to, to, to mature other, you know, syndicated loans with other banks. Uh, so we are doing the same thing, it's happening in, in other countries. And so we'll soon be in a situation where we are borrowing to pay other loans that are maturing, uh, you know. And, 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 but when you look at, it's simple mathematics. Out of this 6.3 trillion, how much of that loan or that debt has been uh, procured in the last seven years or eight years? Is, is close to five trillion. Now you ask yourself, where today can you find infrastructure or investments by this government worth five trillion of debt? You would be hard pressed to find, except that SGR, uh, which my friend uh, Indi has um, uh, belabored a lot in the past. Um, and that's not the only money that is supposed to go to development. Uh, they, they, our own revenues and other, you know, it's, it's also being allocated, you know, each year to, 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 to grow government. But in reality, um, we are not getting value. That's the bottom line. We are not getting value for the debt. And this is why the debt that has been procured is not generating additional revenue. So that's, that's the challenge. Every time when SGR was started, we were told, you guys don't look short term. After three, four, five years, 
the dividends will be so huge, the economy will grow, revenue will go to 20% of, 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 of the GDP and so forth. Our revenue is at 14%, no, no sign of growing except, you know, going down. So I, I think, the, unfortunately, Parliament um, has the powers, both regards to taxation, and we have seen even the challenges. When the government last year tried to introduce, um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, VAT, and Parliament was powerless to stop it. The same thing today, there are so many power, you know, very complicated uh, and, and, and very rational tax measures that have been introduced even this year in the face of this crisis that we have. Um, but again, you will see it more when, when, when it gets the finance bill comes to the floor of the House. Um, it's, it's, it's the executive that, that, that we call the shot. And, and, and so times have changed. Um, in the past, the days of glory of Parliament is gone. When Parliament used to oversight executive, today is the other way around. And, and unfortunately, this debt uh, situation is now, you know, this, this government has developed an insatiable appetite. So they will, it's, it's the easiest way out. So although the minister has said we will try to uh, restructure the debt and try to move away from um, you know, treasury bills and go to long-term bonds domestically and try to go to for concessionary loans to, uh, you know, which are cheaper than this uh, Chinese um, uh, commercial um, uh, loans. But they have said that so many times, so many times. It's just to get a feel good during the budget speech. After the budget speech is over, in a couple of months, we'll back to where we were again, try to redo this budget, get supplementaries, get further loans, you know, all these things will be distracted. So I, I think really, for me, the, the pain is to see that budget is no longer the budget that is true. There's no real effort being made to try and, 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 and incentivize the economy to generate revenue. What is happening is try to squeeze the, the economy, squeeze the business, squeeze the Kenyans, and raise revenue so that it can be misspent for lack of priorities. Because if you look at the priorities in this budget, SMEs, these are the people, 80% of the people in this country depend on small and micro, you know, enterprises or agriculture and this kind of small, you know, informal sector, if you will. But how much of this budget really focuses in building the capacity, in, in giving incentives? Uh, you know, when you calculate, you'll be surprised. You're given the credit guarantees that Rose is talking about to the SMEs of three billion. That's what, 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 what benefit would that be? You are giving a total of 10 billion shillings approximately to assist, you know, the, the small uh, scale irrigation and farmers, you know, and, 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 and out of the, the amount of money that you are locating there. Yet, things like housing, how much money has been given? SDR, how much money has been put in? You look at some of the, then you realize that this government really misses the point that this is the population of Kenya really depend on their own hard work and you need to assist them. You don't need to punish them through more taxes and, and through other you know, measures that will not help them uh, in terms of the debt and so forth. I'd like us to quickly take a look at what the Cabinet Secretary Etrera has said, because you raise um, uh, very serious issues around our borrowing, our debt um, appetite, and why we keep saying we'll restructure it, but it's not happening. I know Mr. Nde will have comments on this, but let's quickly take a look at what the CS said uh, when, uh, you know, reading out the budget in Parliament the other day. Some of the debt burden indicators deteriorating due to the impact of, of the COVID-19 pandemic the government is committed to implement the 2020 medium-term debt strategy, which recommends a shift towards concessional external borrowing and lengthening of maturity structure of the domestic debt. The debt strategy there that Mr. Kerr has just talked about, saying it has been talk for a while, but we don't see much of implementation. Mr. Ndi, you have extensively and in various platforms uh, talked about our debt and how we are managing it. This debt strategy, from what we hear from uh, the CS and what they plan to do, what do you think really, in essence, should be in it? Well, let, uh, uh, let me say one or two things about debt, finish it, and we go back to COVID, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there's a connection there. Mm -hmm. now, the, the thing about the, the debt, the cost of the debt, is this thing that Kenyans love called development projects. So when you talk about parliament, MPs are conflicted because on the one hand they are supposed to oversight and uh, fiscal responsibility, but on the other hand they are there representing constituents who want development projects. 
We never make a connection that the development projects are debt financed. Yeah. So every, every Kenyan, so when I have sort of challenged development projects and said that one, they are low return, and two, they are not, uh, we are, they're, they're, they're sort of, the, the financing is so sustainable. For many, many years, I was called anti-progress, you know, the SGR, the Euro bonds, and the, the mega in infrastructure projects, until the, the debt crisis hit. Uh, but, so we are responsible. I think there is this phrase, choices of consequences, and I think Kenyans need to take responsibility for this idea that you can have endless development projects without asking whether, how they are being financed uh, and whether, what is the return on investment on these development projects. Once this is called a Vision 20 flagship project, it is no longer questionable. It cannot be scrutinized. You are told it is long term. We have to make a sacrifice. So there is a lot of our fiscal irresponsibility has actually been politically popular. So it is. So I actually don't think the MPs could have done anything different. Uh, because even the governors, you know, while people complain about the government borrowing too much, the problem the governors have is that they are not getting what they think is their fair share of that money so that they do their own development projects. So what one hopes is that uh, the uh, country will now learn that there is uh, a cost to uh, living beyond your means. Yeah, that uh, perhaps you'll find that the pendulum will swing the other way and people recognize that there is a cost. But there has been a very huge uh, consensus and support for this idea that we can live beyond our means as long as we are doing development projects. Yeah, so that is what I, I hope that is a lesson that is being learned. Uh, that uh, you cannot actually, uh, that fiscal responsibility is sustainable. You're asking questions about how sustainable is what we are doing, what are the uh, returns on these projects that, uh, that are being funded left, right, and center. Uh, I think that is a question that uh, now needs to come back to the center, hopefully. And I'm coming back yes. to COVID. Uh, so what, you're asking what should be in the debt strategy. Yeah. Uh, one of the points I want to make is that because we have gone into the commercial borrowing, once we made the decision to go into the sovereign debt market, uh, euro bonds, and we have all manner of syndicated loans, trying to restructure your debt is very, very costly in the marketplace. And that's why the government backed off this G20 sort of debt restructuring initiative, because uh, restructuring your debt uh, in the clauses in some of these euro bonds that we have borrowed is actually a default action. Uh, it will affect your credit rating and all other sort of things. There. So, so we are, there is very little scope to actually restructure uh, the debt uh, costlessly. So we are actually in a, a fairly severe sort of debt straight jacket, uh, debt restress straight jacket. What you might want to then try and do is lengthen the maturities of, of domestic debt. But in fact, that is precisely what Jubilee inherited. Jubilee inherited a fairly good sort of uh, mix in terms of the term stru structure of domestic debt. And it is actually the one which has moved the debt maturities back to the short end. Uh, so what is inherited was actually much, uh, much, much better. So they are talking about going back learning, the, the probably learning from, from their mistakes. I actually do not think that uh, there is much sort of uh, political will to do it uh, because these are fairly costly things politically. Uh, what you actually need to do uh, is fairly costly politically. And um, it's not the sort of thing that a government and a president at the end of his term who is frantically trying to, to get uh, his uh, big four financed for, for whatever legacy he thinks he can get out of it. Uh, the kind of uh, re uh, operations, sort of debt operations that you need to do to put our, our public finances on an even keel is not actually consistent. There's a conflict there with the, the sort of like legacy uh, whatever it is that uh, that that uh, Uhuru Kenyatta seems to to see as, as as his legacy, as his economic legacy. So what um, the president finds himself in a very tricky situation where, 
on one hand a struggling economy, but he needs a legacy by the time he leaves office, perhaps? The, the problem that uh, the government at, at this point in its time faces is the following. The, the things you need to do to put the economy back on the even keel is the things that we used to call structural adjustment. Yeah? Uh, which young people may not be familiar with. Now, those things called structural adjustment, for they have a long sort of gestation period. So, for, for government at this point in its uh, uh, term, it will be all pain and no gain. Yeah? The things you will do, all these sort of austerity type things you need to do, uh, all the restructuring is all pain and no gain. But then, that, that was the situation you are facing pre-COVID already. And that's the one I was calling kick the can. So what they can best do is kick the can down the road and make that will be somebody else's problem. So they are going to pile up more debt. Uh, if you recall, just before COVID, uh, when they realized that uh, they, they, they were running into sort of uh, debt distress issues, credit rating issues, they were trying to get onto an IMF program and they were having uh, issues of the fiscal framework, uh, the government had come up with this idea of financing road infrastructure off balance sheet using the road, the road boards or road, road band, what you call off, off balance sheet financing. So that tells you they still want to do the, the, the infrastructure projects. But they want to do that the way that it is not reflected uh, on the government sort of uh, books. Uh, that is this kind of uh, clever sort of accounting that led to the Greek, Greek situation, sort of uh, uh, gymnastics, financial gymnastics that lead you where, where Greece ended. But then now you have COVID. And now with COVID and the kind of response you need to do, you cannot do austerity. Because you cannot be talking about austerity and stimulus in the same breath. The two things are, uh, are, are opposites. Yeah? So COVID response requires actually that you ramp up government spending. Uh, but what you actually want to do is switch uh, where the government spending goes. So what we ought to be doing really to respond to COVID is, and to mitigate its economic impacts is taking money out of development projects, big four if you like, and transferring them to consumers and businesses. Uh, now the problem is I don't think that the government or the president at this stage sees supporting consumers as businesses as his legacy. So there's a conflict of interest between legacy spending and COVID-19 response spending. And I think that's the paralysis that we are seeing, uh, that uh, there is ring fencing of, 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 of legacy projects. And that ring fencing of legacy projects is actually at the expense of the scale of response that uh, COVID-19 requires, to the extent that you hear that Cambridge is learning out of reagents. At this point in time, Cambridge should be the most heavily funded institution in the country. It should have everything it wants at its disposal. The procurement processes should have been sort of fast-tracked so that it can um, secure what it needs. But when you hear that we are struggling to fund testing, but we are putting billions in uh, infrastructure projects, then you can clearly see that there is a tension between legacy project uh, sort of spending, ring fencing that, and what you need even for the public health response to COVID-19. Rock and hard place from, where, uh, from what you say. I want us to quickly take a short break. Remember, this is your show too. We'd love to hear your thoughts on um, the, some of the submissions we're getting from our panelists here. Uh, you can join us. Uh, you can send in your questions on slido.com. You can join us via Zoom. The details are on your screen. You can send in your questions to any panelists, questions, comments, observations. We'd really love you to join into this conversation because we're talking about money in our pockets at the end of the day. The hashtag to you is the front row and I'll be um, you know give, give, uh, posing some of the questions um, that you ask to our panelists even as we continue with the conversation on the corona budget and the bigger picture what does it mean for us let's take a quick break you're watching the front row stay with us